See you. Thanks for listening. April Fools, welcome back to Chat Shit. Round three is complete, and we've had a good round of football, a couple of upsets, and we're going to jump straight into our top five players of the round each. I'll start us off. That was so much worse than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> All right, let's go. Kick it off. Go, top okay. five. The My number five, I don't have any honorable mentions this week. My number five was a guy who I think was has been adjusting to a new role this year. Had a tough first couple rounds, a lot of errors, but really just showed why he's been given that new role this year, and that's Hayden Young. Okay. I thought he was really, really strong and stood out in that uh, in that Fremantle game against when they've gone to three and zero by beating Adelaide, a very hungry Adelaide team that was zero and two, and he really, really stood out for me in that game. Who do you have at five? Um, well, I'll just start with some honourable mentions. Oh, yeah. So I had Warple from today's game. He picked up a lot of touches as well in the last quarter when it was when it was wet. It was a very, very scrappy game, and Alex Pierce who seems to be back to his form of two years ago, really stepping up as the captain. Just wanted to give him a quick honorable mention. Um, but my number five is, is Jamie Elliott. Kicked four goals. Um, I think what Colling would have missed in the last few weeks is forward pressure. And I don't know, that must have been drilled into them in the week because he really brought it. There was one moment in the game where I can't remember who he chased down, but someone tried to break a tackle and he nailed them and, and went back and kicked through from like 40 meters out. Yeah, it's crazy how in all in so many of Collingwood's like huge games over the past couple of years, it's been Jamie Elliott kicking one after the siren or he goes crazy in the fourth quarter. But yeah, just a completely different I also player. just want to say this top five was very hard to make. I feel like in previous weeks, mm. there's been a really like five to seven sort of stand-up players of the round. We've had very similar top fives. But, but here, it's just sort of players that had a pretty good game maybe influenced it in, in not so much in the stats but yeah, the end he did kick four goals yeah but yeah he's my number five who's your number four at number four i have harry mckay who was has just been great all season for carlton so i wanted to just give him a nod but he definitely deserves uh deserves to be somewhere in the top five uh when charlie kernel and harry mckay are both at top form which they are right now it's a really scary combo um harry mckay has been good kicking well for now the Three, three games out of three, and it's a scary prospect for the rest of the league. Do you remember when we were at the SCG? It was, it was last season, and we loved when he used to mark the ball inside 50 because we knew it wasn't going through. Last year, when we played against Carlton, Swans got a win, and it, was, it wasn't it was a very tight game, so we were letting loose a bit, but when, whenever Harry Mackay marked it, he marked one like 10 meters out on a slight angle. We start cheering like some like a Swans player had taken a spare yeah. because we just knew he was going to miss, and he did. He went zero goals for that game or something. Well, yeah, he's a hundred percent. He seemed like he sorted out his kicking. He's got his confidence back. He used to be going around the corner from twenty meters out last year. Yeah. Um, I will just say I have him at number two. I was really impressed with his performance. Um, yeah. This week, uh, he not only did he take marks inside fifty, he comes up the ground really well, and he has a great on-field kick. Um, so he comes up, he can take a big pack mark, and then. It's really great when you see him. He turns, gets in the half turn on his left foot, and he finds Kerno. Um, so yeah, really good field. He, he was my number two. He took ten marks. He was great in the ruck as well, playing as that second ruck mm. role. Twelve score involvements, five goals. Um, he's back, unfortunately. Gun. He's gone. But yeah, I'll go into my number four. I had Lockie Neal. Love it. Um, and I know that they lost, but in a Brisbane side that was pretty hard to watch, he stood out. And I mean. What can we expect from from Lockie Neal now? He had 35 touches, a goal, um, and I'm just really happy that, that he's back. It's not like he left, he did get injured, um, but he he really impressed me from that game. Yeah. In a game where there weren't huge, too many standouts. We've talked about how Lockie Neal, I don't have Lockie Neal in here, but we've talked about how he just has, his, his hands are so much better than anyone else in the competition, how clean he is in the contest. And AFL is definitely a sport where for people who maybe haven't watched as much, it's hard to see players' skill levels stand out because it's a bit chaotic, especially in the contest. But he stands so head and shoulders above everyone else currently in the league well, when it comes to those skills. I just want to say, I think we're going to look back in once he's retired, and I think he's going to be one of the most underappreciated players in the game. I understand he's got two brown lows. He could potentially win another one, but it just feels like every time he's won a brown low, the, the general consensus is how did he win it? And, and he just puts up performance after performance every single week. Robbed of the Australian. I think year. 100%. He, he look, we look back, underappreciated midfielder. Maybe because, probably because he's not on a Melbourne team. Maybe. They're probably. Imagine if Lockie Neal was on Essendon or Carlton or something. Yeah, I he'd mean, be getting a lot of a lot more attention throughout his career. Now, even when he was at Frio, he's never been in a Melbourne team. True. And at three, I have James Warple, who you touched on. And I thought he was really, really strong in a Hawthorne team, which 
has been playing a terrible system. Sam Mitchell, I think, uh, you, you give him time to grow. It's a somewhat a rebuilding season, but the system's not working at all. They're chipping balls around without anything really coming of it. They're getting dominated all over the ground without sort of playing with a purpose to get it up the field. But James Warple is doing absolutely everything he can. He just puts like, up numbers, doesn't oh, he? It's not just numbers, yeah. though. I think people sort of saw him as a, a, a guy that just sort of has a bit of energy and doesn't have a lot of finesse, except he's a skilled player too, and he was elite today. And I, I thought he, he put up a fight in a Hawthorne team, which which wasn't very good. Who'd you have a three? A three, I had Alex Neil Bullen. Uh, I've got him at two. Oh, okay. I've got him okay. at two. So was that the person yeah. you thought I might not have? I wasn't sure. Oh, okay, wasn't so sure. yeah, I... I don't know how much he caught of this this Melbourne game, but it, Tell me it's, it. it's the stuff he does off the ball. I think it's huge. I get then he kicked two goals. Are you talking but, about his uni degree and his TikTok? I am not talking about his oh, uni okay. degree and his TikTok. Okay. Off um, the ball. Two goals, uh, 24 disposals. But no, it's his running and his work rate off the ball that that I think really stood out here. And in a, in a round where there weren't many top-class performances, in a game that felt like a finals-type game, to really stand up in a position that I feel like is really hard to, to be noticed in, and I know the commentators were saying it as well. There was some analysis done on AFL 360 from a camera behind the goal about how much he's working just to take that mark, yep. to make that tackle. And I think forward pressure might be underappreciated in our game. He's one of the best at it. He's got a great kick. He pops up in the clutch moments. Kicked a goal from 50 in the last quarter um, to probably seal the game. So yeah, I was really impressed with his performance. Alex Nilbullen, his impact is not at all shown on the stats. So. And he's always going to bring that, that, as you say, that forward pressure and just that effort to be the outlet pass on the wing or on the half forward line is is always just like motivational for his teammates. Like It's been the case for his whole career. And so when he stacks up the stats as well, he's had an elite game because he has good games even when he puts up no stats. So that was awesome from Alex Nilbullen and I had him at two. 100%. You've already had mentioned your two, which My is two Harry was Mackay. My two was Harry Mackay, yeah. Okay, number one, I had... I think this guy was a very clear number one for me, and it was Nick Floster. Yeah, okay, we both uh, have the same one. As a Sydney fan, it like it was very, very noticeable when we went forward. Nick Floster just always was in the right spot, read the ball better than anyone else. I'm not sure how many intercept marks he took, but I think he took at least six or seven just in the third quarter, uh, which is where the game swung in in Richmond's favour, and he was just amazing. Went out a hundred percent with the ball. 29 disposals, 23 of them kicks, and did not, like every single one of them went to a teammate. He was absolutely amazing, and that's pretty much as perfect a defensive performance as you're gonna get. As in, I, I don't really have to add too much yeah. to that, but yeah, just on top of that, seven score involvements from playing fullback, pretty much as well. He's a guy um, that could absolutely snag a, like a, a smoky for all Australian. Yeah, yeah, in, definitely, in a, in a definitely back an outside shot if he continues this form. Or if he continues playing like that, he's almost a shoe in for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll move on. And usually we have our hits and misses, but I, I've found this quiz online that I, that I want you to take. We've got a top 10. We're doing a top 10 this okay, week. Okay, sure, sure. Now what it is, it's the top 10. I actually don't know about this, by the way. It's the top 10 highest paid players in 2024. Interesting. Who, I thought some of the contracts don't get released. Am I, so or, it's- Or not it, it, was, it was. I went over a few websites and I sort of took the average of each okay, one. Okay. And I found that it's what they're getting paid in 2024. So don't worry about front-ended and back-ended Ooh. contracts. How much are these players being paid in 2024? I have the top 25, but I'm just looking for the top 10 here. Okay, I'm gonna do terribly at okay, this. Okay, and I'm just gonna say, it's very, very tough. There are a couple obvious ones, and I don't think you'll get number one. One of the guests I'm gonna go for Aaron Norton. Aaron Norton is number 25 and 900,000. Oh, okay. okay, okay. But oh, I think it's with his new contract extension where they're talking it about. It could be back-ended. It could but, be back-ended. Um, this is how much they're getting so paid So maybe it's someone who signed a deal a little while ago. I'll go Dustin Martin. Number two, well done. Okay. Yeah, um, 1.35 million. Okay, maybe a team that would have been desperate to sign a guy like James Sicily. James Sicily, number 18. Oh, So you're, you're, you're in and around the right areas. <laughs> Nat Fife. Nat Fife, number three. Okay, 1.15 okay, cool. million. Okay, so it's probably guys who got signed and like would have signed big contracts a few years ago. Maybe Charlie Kerno. Charlie Kerno. No, Nowhere. Not in the top 25. Is it older guys, typically? Yes. Oh, Max Gorn. No. Christian mm. Petrarca. Yes, he's number eight. And Clayton Oliver. Number seven. I don't know. Yeah. Tom Lynch. Lynch. Tom Lynch is number Tom 10. Tom Lynch. Just over a million. Okay. Ooh, one. That's terrible. I don't think you get number one. Someone like Zach Merritt. No. I don't think you get number one. I just... 
Just spit on. Okay, there are two from West Coast. Tim Kelly. Tim Kelly's number five. 1.1 1. 1 million. Number one? Is it? No. Don't worry about number one. Don't worry you, about number one. You don't think one. I'll get it? No. Jeremy McGovern. Number four. Well done. Oh, good. Best player in the competition. Oh, Marcus Bonson. Number six. That's so silly of that, me. That, he was a shoe in There's uh, number nine. Toby Green. No. Number nine you should get. Number one, I don't think you'll touch. Okay. Charlie Cameron. No. Close. Jeremy Cameron. Wait, there we go. Number nine. <laughs> also just over a million. Well, I will just say. One. Number one is on 1.5 million in 2024. Okay, what 1.5 million? What position does he play on the field? He's a back. I say his contract is extremely front loaded and he is going to average 850k. <laughs> in this year, he's earning 1.5 million. Okay. Recent transfer. Ben Mackay. Ben Mackay is number one. He's sitting at 1.5 million here. That is so silly. Dustin Martin, number two. Nat Five, number three. McGovern, four. Tim Kelly, five. Bontempelli, six. Clayton Oliver, seven. Petrarca, eight. Jeremy Cameron, nine. And Tom Lynch, number 10. Wow. Darcy Moore was number 11. That's a really tough list. It oh. is a tough list. It's a tough <laughs> list. We jump straight into hits and misses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you want to kick us off with, with your yeah, misses? Yeah, hits and misses from the round. Misses to misses. start off? Let's start off with misses. Okay, I'll give you my two misses. The first one I had was, I think Daniel Gorringe did some good videos about this that the Brisbane Lions let down the nation. They let down the world. They had literally everyone on their side. Everyone was, would have absolutely been laughing their heads off if Collingwood was 0-4, heading into, uh, the, I don't know. Hawthorne, who they lost yeah. to last year, and then, <laughs> then the bye. The bogey team. So yeah. heading into Finn McGuinness and the bye. But uh, Brisbane letting down the nation and the Gabba Fortress has been breached, I've written there. Uh, they've lost two yeah. from two at the Gabba. I think they're going to have to fight hard to bring back that confidence and that whole mystique around them being unbeatable at the Gabba because they're 0-2 now. Um, the second miss for me was Adelaide again and specifically Adelaide's midfield, which is star-studded in terms of Crouch, Laird and Dawson, but it's very samey. There's not enough change-ups in there. There's not enough guys running through there. Like you compare it to a team like the Swans whose midfield is performing a lot better, but they have way less firepower in there with Mills, Parker, Adams all injured. You have guys who are far less talented or uh, far smaller names on paper like Justin McInerney, James Jordan, uh, Tom Papley, who's usually a forward coming in there, um, James Rowbottom. Guy, those guys all running through the midfield and it just means that guys go in there with a lot of energy and with a lot of purpose knowing that they're not going to get that much time there. Uh, so the Adelaide midfield is getting a very samey and not well, being do effective. you feel like Laird and Krauss do the same thing? Yes, and I think because I feel like they're just an easy handball sort of sort of play. And I think the way that Dawson's kicking the ball early in, early in the season, they're prob they're probably all none of them are being that piercing midfielder that can like none of them are running through the pack. Well, I think that's and, harming Walker's, yeah. Tex Walker's game as well. And none of them are delivering the ball and like delivering quality balls well, to I mean, the forward line. Last year, Dawson was a big body midfielder with an Errol Goulden type kick. Yeah, he He's was now unbelievable. A big body midfielder. <laughs> that's it. That's it. But uh, yeah, the Adelaide was the highest scoring team in the AFL last year. I did see that actually. They were the highest scoring team in the AFL, and they are not playing anywhere near that this year. Te yeah. Tex Walker is also playing poorly, just not. Well, he probably isn't getting as much service as he did last year. Like you did, like you did. I know he's, he's when he's at his best, he like, makes it happen. True, but. true. But then when you're getting spearing balls, which are just leaving the ground by a couple meters. On a lead, I mean, it's, mm. it's going to be a lot better than what he's getting at, getting at the moment. Yeah, move on to let's move on to your misses. My misses. So I've got the the use of Wangani Malira. Last mm. week he was both. I think was he both in our top five? I think he might have both. both he was in my honorable mentions. Honorable mentions. Like okay, he was in my top five. He was absolutely exceptional, and we knew his role was going to change a little bit with with Sinclair coming back. It was a huge breakout game. It was a huge breakout game, but with Sinclair coming back, obviously they're all Australian. He's going to go back into that centre half back. Um, but what what did happen, Wanganee Malira was used on the wrong side. So what happened was, Bon is a left footer, and he usually plays on, on the half back side on the left. Wanganee Malira usually plays on the right. I looked at the heat maps. I might even put them up here <laughs> if I bothered to edit, but I did look at the heat maps. Wanganee Malira played about 75% of the game on the left side, being a right foot kick. Bon up being, being, being a left foot kick, played on the right side. Um, I know I know Bonner had a had a very average game. It's like solo and Mane. But they were playing on the wrong side, and then we saw them swap in the last quarter. We saw Wangani Malira um, have a had a pretty good last quarter. I know they lost the game, but he racked up the disposals, uh, got a few kicks, but 
but Essendon sort of had the momentum going into that last quarter. But I just think there was no reason to change anything. I don't know why he was playing on the wrong side, but it just felt like the ball wasn't going through him. It, it felt like they were mainly going down the right side. Bonner got a lot of the ball. Um, and they really struggled to, to build through the ground off, off the back of that. You saw a stat, didn't you, about Bonner? Do you remember? It was something about turnovers. It was something about uh, the amount of times he turned over the ball. It was, I think it was 19. 19. And it was, it's an outright AFL all-time record for the most turnovers in a game. Well, potentially because he was playing on the wrong side. Yeah. Um, it's in, insane. Stat. 19 turnovers. Yeah, it was either 17 or 19 from memory. But it's an all-time outright. He broke the outright record for, for most turnovers in a game by a player. Wow. Well, I, did, I, I didn't know that was the all-time record. I knew he yeah. had a lot of turnovers, but yeah. Well, since they were counted, which probably has been a few decades or something. Yeah, but I just, yeah, that was a huge error, I think, on, on their part, not to use one of their biggest halfback weapons on, on the correct side. Um, move on to my second miss, and it, I don't even know if it's a miss anymore. What is West Coast? What, I mean, what are they doing? Where did they go from here? They kicked one goal in the last 50 to 55 minutes of game time. They looked awful against a Bulldogs team who... Couldn't even bother. Couldn't be bothered to play Marcus Bonds and Pelly at full forward. Yeah, it's it's not good when it's happening for this many seasons because it's, it's probably equally bad to what it was last year at points. Um, it's not like it's gotten worse, except we were hoping it would have gotten better. Uh, I don't. What do you? We, let's return to the chat. We didn't prepare for this, but let's return to the chat about priority picks. Are you in principle against them? I feel like if you're not against them in principle, then it follows that you have to support it for West Coast right now. If any team is ever going to get a priority pick, it's West Coast right now. Um, but I, you feel like the, the truth is, in a lot of ways, West Coast have done it for themselves. to themselves. They've had a great setup as a team for decades, a very successful team since for the whole 2000s and 2010s, but they just fully committed to the 2016 Premiership window. Oh, sorry, the, like the, the 2018, they committed to that premiership window and yes, it got them a premiership, but they left themselves with no draft picks, no youth, um, and even no like lower to mid-age players. Well, this I think they've completely put this on themselves, yeah. which they probably knew what was going to happen when they front-ended and went for the premiership a few years ago and good on them, they got it. But I think when Gold Coast a few years ago were getting these priority picks and North Melbourne got those priority picks, it's not because they did it to themselves they probably just didn't draft very well some of their top players were leaving um and they put yeah. in a request to the afl and they were like oh yeah it's it's a little bit of an imbalance it's not it is kind of your fault but it's not really your fault that this has happened so we'll give you the picks i think it's difficult for what I, I think they're going to get priority picks i think it's very likely i think it's difficult for that for west coast to mount a case though when they chose to pick one guy in Harley Reid, who's a great player and is going to be a great player, when they could have traded that for three really great players. Potentially a, a pick two and a late first round pick. And in the position they're in, they need to build a core of young players. We see it time and time again, AFL, you have 18 players on the field, 22 guys in your team. There's one guy cannot turn rubbish into gold. Ooh. Gary Ablett was dropping 50 disposals a game and almost winning the Brownlow medal and Gold Coast in their first in their infancy was still getting demolished every week. One guy's not going to do it. Well, it's I think it's very noticeable when one player isn't performing in your 22. I think if you yeah. watch a team, you can really tell when one guy's off. And at the moment with West Coast, it's probably about 15 guys. Mm. Uh, maybe. I don't focus on the West Coast games too much. But from what I have seen, there aren't many standouts or, or many... Uh, Elliot Yeo is playing well. McGovern was very good at the back as well. Yeah, um, he was. Liam Duggan has been consistent for a few as years. In, yeah, but, but I mean, what are we going to pick out? Six or seven players in, yeah. in a squad of 40, in a, yeah. in a match day squad of 22. Um, and it's really disappointing. I don't think they deserve the priority picks. I think I'm in agreement with you there. I, I don't think they deserve them. I don't think they deserve them. I think, I think they should get them, though, just... For the league to be in a better place. For, yeah, uh, for the balance of the league, that makes sense. But just thinking about the reason why they get them, what they're gonna they're gonna ask them because they've been terrible the last few years and mm. they've seen no development. Well, look what you did. You did that to yourself, and you can pay the price, and your fans will pay the price. But then again, if you're the AFL, looking at one of the biggest clubs, I think second or third highest membership between, behind Collingwood and Richmond or something. And you're looking at them, oh, we've got to keep bringing fans to the games. We've got to keep this big team interested. Absolutely. One one team down now with Tasmania Devils. Tasmania, I mean, when they come in, they're <laughs> going to get all these priority picks. Um, but, yeah. No, as they should. As they but, should. Yeah. But yeah. I think, yeah, um, West Coast will probably get them. I just don't think they deserve them. Fair enough. 
Uh, interesting, interesting. Now, have you done your second miss? Oh, that was your second that miss? Was, that was my second okay, miss. Okay. I'll hit you with my two hits. Go on. Did you catch that? The first hit was which something that I'll touch on briefly because we talked about it earlier, was the Makai Kerno duo. Easily, uh, yeah. well, actually, Jeremy Cameron and Tom Hawkins have been elite to start the year, but those are pro uh, Kerno Makai, Cameron Hawkins, are those the two best key forward pairings. And yeah, you now have two... Coleman medal, recent Coleman medalists who are at the top of their game. It's, it's both, scary side. Yeah, both at peak age, peak at a peak athleticism, uh, and playing at a high skill level, with a team that has a, an elite midfield and a strong defence. They they look scary, and they are something to look out for because I reckon they could they could end up one and two on the Coleman. Um, my second hit is potentially the Essendon Edge. <laughs> we, I like that. We talked it down last week, but they they stuck to it this week. They still played with that sort of grit and a bit of and 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 hunger and stuck with that personality that they've that they've tried to to propagate. And they got the win against a real an St Kilda side that's been looking very very strong in the preseason and and the early season. And fair enough too. The Messenger now are two and one, and and got a big win under their belt. So uh, that that's my second hit. I have a little bonus hit, which is. Holding Nick Martin and Hayden Young in Supercoach, I was just scrolling through tweets of people, two people being upset that they got rid of them, and I was it was making me quite happy. Um, so that's my bonus hit. Fair, fair enough. Hit me just, with yours. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. on on that Nick Martin game, I just want to highlight his game because he did <laughs> drop out about 44, dis 40, 44 disposals. Did you hear the Kane Corns rant? I did not hear the Kane Corns rant. Uh, he said that the fact that uh, kick-ins where you just r like run. A one or two steps outside the box. The fact that they count as a disposal is a uh, travesty to the stats, and that it's, you know, Nick Martin just broke the Essendon all time record for disposals in a game, but six of them were kick outs where he took one or two steps out of the box. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, that Nick Martin on a 40, when you look at a 44 disposal game, you expect best on ground. I think one of the least effective players on the ground. I know he had 44 disposals. He's a good player. People he's, expect no, no, no. a lot of him. He's a good player, but, but, it's a 44 but 30, 30 disposals were like in the back 50. Just a bunch of kick-ins, kicking around. Like, good on him. Good for your server coach. But I think it's it, it wasn't an amazing game from him. Carried his team to a big win, Nick Martin. Um, I think the St. Kilda missing might have carried his team to a <laughs> big win. Um, I'll go on to, to, to my hits, though. Okay. Um, I think a big thing in AFL is... A one, well, confidence, and two, how much effort you put into a game. Richmond pressure in that game. It was I elite. saw the stat. They stayed above 200 for about 85 to 90% of the game. Um, and the Swans really struggled. We, we know the Swans for their ball movement transition from back 50 to forward 50. The amount of pressure that Richmond put on the Swans for the, almost the entire game and a really tough to see that uh, full-flowing Swans uh, halfback midfield. And I just want to commend them because they haven't got the most experienced team. They're not ranked highly this season. This was a very one-sided game from what we when we would have previewed it last week. Um, but good, like a huge respect to the to their players for putting in the pressure and putting in the effort, which is which is a big part of winning an AFL game. Yeah, we know that Sydney are the best kicking team in the league, who take on the centre of the ground more effectively than any other team and transition more cleanly and very beautifully a bit more cleanly than anyone else in the league. And Richmond made them look mediocre, made them make a lot of errors, and the Swans really never were able to... Or they, were, they were able to adjust in terms of stopping making errors by trying to go through the middle, but the only way they were able to do that was by just going long down the line. Uh, and then you end up having Nick Vlosten taking eight or nine intercept marks, completely dominating the game. Oh, did I say Nick Martin? Nick Vlosten. Yes. Nick Sorry. Vlosten taking a bunch of intercept marks and dominating the game. And... Yeah, the, our key forwards just got dominated when we went long down the line. So fair enough to Richmond. They, they found a way to nullify that, that Sydney game style. Yeah, and yeah, that's a huge thing. If you put pressure on the opponent, guys like Vlosten are going to absolutely love it. Guys like Tom yep. Stewart, uh, Sicily, for yep. example. When I move on to my second hit, the Frio defense. Now, we know Adelaide have started poorly, but Adelaide kicked four goals the whole game. They didn't kick a goal for the last 50 minutes of actual game time um, in that game. Alex Pierce, like I mentioned earlier, as, as an honorable mention, he was awesome. i um, completely nullified. Tex Walker, uh, Luke Ryan just does his thing at the back. Always sweeping up, always effective. Yes, he gets a lot of disposals from kickouts, but who cares? He's great. Um, God, he slipped my name. Jordan Clark. He's been amazing. He's been incredible. He's one of those smaller defenders that, like, sort of like Ed Richards, that slips into gaps and takes intercept marks and is but, really but strong. But he was great. Um, 
and they're just entire midfield uh, their entire defense all all around the ground was great completely nullified Adelaide it was a very boring game not a lot happened but still to keep the highest scoring team of last year to four goals and not a lot of clear-cut opportunities I think was very respectable for, for Fremantle, who struggled to defend last year. And two years ago, when Fremantle won a final, they were arguably the best defensive team in the league. And now we see them with a midfield, which is super exciting, with Sorong and Brayshaw at their peak, and now Nat Fife healthy and Hayden Young turning into a gun midfielder. So now, you, and Luke Jackson or Sean Darcy, whoever it is, one of, they're one of the best Ruckman in the league in there, whoever it is. They have a really strong midfield now with an elite defense that's firing again. I think their forward line is the only thing stopping them from being a real premiership contender because they still have an undermanned forward line when it comes to top end talent. But if they can find some sort of system for their forward line and where they apply a lot of pressure and everything, who knows? Because yeah. they, they are really good in their well, defense. Also, just shout out to James Aish, who started the season mm -hmm. really well and uh, the debutant of last week, two games now, uh, Draper. Who's, who's been alright, he's filling a role, he's doing he's doing a good job. Sammy Draper's only played two games. I think it's only two games. <laughs> oh no, it's Joshua Draper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'll move on. Uh, we'll move on to the, my pyramid. And yeah, the there's, pyramid. there's not as many changes as last week, but there's been a bit of movement. Okay, cool. So you'll, I've, see, I've, you'll see, appreciate Aiden's arrows up and down. And yeah, it's easy to see, everything. it's easy to see. Right in front good, of us, it's right a good graphic. sort of here, sitting on the table. Now what I've done, I've added, some, I've added something here. It's called the fringes. There are players on the fringes that are okay. making the top 15. Okay, cool. I've got Zach Merritt. I have Raul and Sam Taylor are all on the fringes of my of my top 15. I'm robbing my boy Taylor, man. He's a top five player in the league. I genuinely think that. Currently, he didn't play. Unlucky. And we're going to see that again. <laughs> the out is Toby Green. He has left the top 15. Fair didn't, enough. Didn't play. Hasn't started the season uh, as we might have expected. Nah, I like it. Cutthroat. But here we are. Goulden has moved down a rank. He is now in the fifth tier of, of players. Okay. Uh, Zach Butters is held. Tom Stewart is held. Lockie Neal is now back in the in the pyramid after the first week. After he, got, bye. he got dropped after the bye, the bye. got dropped out. Yep. He's back. He had a great game. And Good. Jackson holds his spot. Luke Jackson. Going Luke Jackson, yeah, yeah, holds his spot. Going up a tier. Gorn holds his spot. Cripps. Gorn got fifty hit outs, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Cripps has moved up a tier. He's now in the fourth tier. Sarong holds his spot, and Kerno holds his spot. I will say. Uh, not on your pyramid, just on Gorn quickly. Mm -hmm. Hitouts are an overrated stat. We've known this for a long time, which is why they say hitouts to advantage. He got 50 hitouts to sold those 20 or something. Port one clearances by 15 to 20. But anyway, I like the tiers so far. I like the stats. That's great. <laughs> We're going to the third tier. Nick Dacos holds a spot in the third tier after dropping two tiers last week. The Dacos pyramid is The is Dacos shambles. pyramid is is not his pyramid no more. Clayton Oliver holds a spot. He was good again. Clary. Tom Green drops down. He's now in the third tier. Uh, Unlucky, didn't play. We're cutthroat. <laughs> That's what we do here. Moving up a ranking, Isaac Heaney. Oh, is now I a, like it. He's now I a top like three it. player in the competition. We question, can he continue to do it? He can. He continues to do it. He can do it. He's he's had a Horse. awesome... Wait, can we address John Longmire directly? Let's right do now? it. Let's look right on the camera. John Longmire, we beg to you. When Taylor Adams... Uh, he, Taylor Adams played in the VFL this he week. He had a good game. He's, he'll come back. He's a great player. and He should be in the midfield. Don't take Isaac Heaney's minutes. James Jordan... Can have a couple weeks in the VFL. I like him, but he's been poor the last couple weeks. James Jordan can. can Who was that debutant? He was terrible. Caleb Mitchell wasn't yeah. great, but we've said that about a lot of Swans debutants that have turned out great. It's true. We'll Matt bring Ro him back in a year. Yeah, Matt Roberts, yeah. Justin McInerney yeah. had awful debuts and they've turned out good. True. But, yep, yeah, don't take Isaac Heaney's midfield minutes. Keep him 75 25 or 70 30. Please. It's great when he get, when he rests forward because he then goes, takes a couple marks, kicks a couple goals, and then comes back and dominates the midfield. But, we need him having that midfield time. We've been dominated in the center clearance for too long now and been relying on our defense and transition and our effectiveness in our forward line. And we've just continually been dominated in the center for years. Allow Isaac Heaney to lift our midfield. But yeah, he's number two. And if he keeps going, I could easily see him as taking that number one spot. Whoa! He's potentially, <laughs> potentially four games and Brownlow votes in every single one of those games. Potentially. I cannot say that about any other player in the competition at the moment. Fair. On the same ranking is Marcus Bontempelli. If he had a huge game this week, he would have probably been number one. He was carrying you got him a... up. No, no, no. no, no he's, same, he was same. in two. He moved okay. up last week. Cool. Um, he probably would have been number one if he had a huge game. Is carrying a light. I think it's an ankle injury. Um, and played full forward. Still kicked three goals. Nine almost, tackles. Nine tackles. Still had a great game. But yeah, he holds the spot number two. Number one, same as last week. 
Christian Petrarca. Had another good game, deserves to hold his spot, but he's got Heaney and Bont right behind him. <laughs> love it, love but yeah, it. Yeah, that's, good, that's good the pyramid segment. for this week, right in front of you, and we'll see you again next week. And now I'm gonna be sitting closer to you. You'll have the power rankings from last week next to this. And remember, this is sort of on vibes. For example, Brisbane, you'd think will make some sort oh, of comeback at some point. Oh, I thought going to put Brisbane last. <laughs> so I completely... Oh, I mean, I, no, no. Okay. Okay, okay. Let's, we'll start off. Okay, I'm going to stick in the bottom three, which have stayed the same since last week, which is West Coast, Hawthorne, and North in order from 18th to 16th. Yeah. West Coast, we've same. said enough. Hawthorne, we've said enough. Interesting stat about Hawthorne. Yep. Yeah. They've, I don't believe they've won any quarter besides every single second quarter they've played this year. <laughs> Just an interesting stat. That's an... I don't get it, but they love second quarters. If you don't love that, what do you love about footy? Come on. I mean, what, where are you getting those <laughs> sort of stats? West Coast haven't won any quarter except... Not a single <laughs> quarter. 12 quarters. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know why the fans keep turning yeah, up. But yeah, but come on. Gosh, that's really difficult to not win a single quarter. 100% but... agree. 18, 17, 16. Let's move on. But it is notable that Hawthorne are in 17, even though they were here last week, because... We had expectations of them off the back half of last year that they take a big leap. Has not been the case. They've, they've been poor. Now, in 15, the same as last week is Adelaide. And they they don't look good. We've talked about it. Their midfield is not effective at the moment. It's not the, it's not penetrating and producing quality balls for the forward line. And their defense is weak. It's it's not They don't have high end talent in their defense. And it's, it's just not a strong defense, key back-wise. They have a very tough next few weeks. They currently in gather round, obviously at home, Adelaide Oval, they play Melbourne. Then they go away to, to Carlton. Then they play the Essendon Edge back at Adelaide. Yep. Um, and then they go North Melbourne. If you're on the fixtures right now, I think it's fair to say all three of Adelaide's games so far have been against teams that you'd think would be similar to them, like mid-table sides. So they've had three. Yeah, goal, they lost to Gold Coast. Gold Coast. Too long have looked great. Yep. But they, that was at home. We would yep. expect that game to be yep. at least 50-50. But teams do you think are competing for finals, but not necessarily a top, the top four or five and premiership favourites? With a, and they had a terrible game against so, as well. So I agree. three we, huge games against sides that they would see themselves as being having similar expectations and they've really let themselves down. But we down. could definitely probably see them falling even more if the next next couple of weeks... I mean... Melbourne, if they lose to Melbourne home, go 0-4, Carlton away, they could be 0-5. They could yeah. easily be 0-5 here. Yeah, Adelaide are, are in some trouble. and We know they have the talent in the midfield and forward line to produce some scoring, but a lot of things are going to have to change. In 14, I have Richmond, which is crazy. They just produced a really good game, but it, like, I'd love to see them do that when they're not forced to because they're 0-3. You know, uh, they were really forced to produce a high adrenaline, high octane, incredible pressure game. I'd love to see them, that be their identity, and then they could jump up the ranking if I think that that's who they are. But right now, I, I, I need to see it proven for more than one game. Just something on Richmond. I don't know if you saw, but a huge hit to their, their win yesterday. Um, Tom Lynch is out for about six to eight weeks through injury. He tore something something in his leg. I like, didn't even say that. Um, but yeah, he's out. Uh, uh, just for that, that's why I have them in 14. Um, and Baker got given a week um, for his bump. Which I quite, I sort of disagree with, but it's 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 okay. As in, even as a Swans fan, I'm not sure if that should have been a week, except that is kind of what they're doing now. And they're trying to stamp out a certain action, which is the, the late unnecessary bump where you're not going for the ball at all. But yeah, um, unfortunate for, for Richmond when one of their star players who just came back from injury missed the whole preseason. And played awesome. Was played awesome, awesome against us. this week, was good last week as well. Yeah. And now I think it I think it might be six to eight, maybe even longer. Yeah, we want to see Tom Lynch getting consistent footy in, so that's really sad to see. Okay. 13 I have Essendon. Essendon Edge. The good. Essendon Edge. Two and one, but very close game against the Kilda. St. Kilda didn't play anywhere near their best. Um, and there's just so much competition in these middle spots right now that uh, Essendon sit in 13. In 12th, I have the Brisbane Lions, who dropped from, I think, 6th last week. Uh, they had a chance at the Gabba to to show, to show try to stamp some authority and get their momentum back after a bye, and they were not good. Both grand finalists starting the season 0-3. Unreal. There I don't is know. a grand final hangover. Yes, <laughs> it's real. It happened last year with Sydney and Geelong, and it's happened even harder this year. But Brisbane, they... Yeah, they've had three games now and none of them have they looked like the Brisbane that we know. So at the moment, they're going to sit in 12. If they lose to North in Gather Round... <laughs> this week? This coming week on... Where, where, where do they go in the power rankings? Where do they go in the power rankings? Better question is where do North go? <laughs> <laughs> That's thinking. <laughs> but, but yeah, they'd probably go, go south because Richmond and Essendon are, are doing everything that they can right now to go further up in the rankings. So 
In number 11, I've got the Bulldogs, who have had two good wins in a row. Remind me who they played two rounds ago, if you're on the fixtures. Bulldogs? Yeah. They, so they just beat West Coast, who they beat the round before? The round before, they, they pumped Gold Coast. Yeah. So that actually, that was a huge win against Gold Coast, but diff it's you can't really judge a team against West Coast. We'll say that a lot with the power rankings this year. So they'll stay around 10 or 11. To be fair, they did only lose to Melbourne. Yes. Um, who are looking very good this yes. season following their round zero loss. But... The case is, I think Melbourne, I sort of see as maybe the fourth or fifth best side in the comp. If you want to be, I think, a top eight team, you've got to be competing with those sides in the top four, making it a competitive That's game. That's fair. And uh, the Bulldogs, I really want to see them in another game against a top eight side. It's like a, a team as good as Melbourne, Carlton, one of the Sydney teams, Collingwood. And I want to see them uh, play good footy like they've played the last couple of weeks. Because I, I, I don't, like, they're... they're is potential, and it's been the case in previous years, that West, uh, the, the Bulldogs are flat-track bullies. Uh, like some of the Australian batsmen at the WAC are just, as soon as the pitch starts turning, they can't do anything. So, at number 10, I've got Collingwood, uh, who make a little bit of a jump with a big win. Uh, it's difficult to say just after that game whether that says more about Brisbane or Collingwood, except uh, Collingwood absolutely needed that to not be 0-4. And, and they produced. Just something huge. Next week, Collingwood play Hawthorne. We all know what happened last time. <laughs> yeah. I also want to point out, Finn McGuinness did not play this week. Man is being arrested to hunt down Nick Dacos next week. <laughs> I'm just saying. You have the best at his position in the league and he can't get a game. So Hawthorne just played Geelong. I guess because Pat Dangerfield, Dangerfield was didn't play. They thought that Geelong don't have a midfield. I would have tagged Grime Myers. Yeah, he's amazing. amazing. He was very effective when he gets the ball. Grime or Messi. He's one of my... great job. He's... Maybe my favorite player that's not at the Swans, like in terms of just most underrated players. I don't know if you saw in the reel, in this reel, I don't know if you did, but in the text editing, there was one where we mentioned Grian Myers and it says Grian or Messi. <laughs> I just want to point that out. I don't know if you've seen that reel or noticed that. Is that. Did you not do it manually? It does it automatically. It does. The text is automatic. Wow. But um, yeah, I made that edit because... Maybe that says something about our accent, how we speak, but um, Grain or Messi, it's a, it's a good nickname. They've used it anyway. They the have used it before, yeah. yeah. Okay, number nine, I've got Gold Coast. The bye, they stay about where they were last week. I think they may have even gone up a spot, um, but they have had a good couple rounds and they'll need a big bounce back from that Bulldogs game, but I've really liked what I've seen, especially from their midfield. They play GWS in, in gather round. Yes, I'd say... They're a midfield which probably has similar levels of talent to that Adelaide midfield, but you have a couple of younger, like different guys going through there, and you have different types of players like Noah Anderson and Tuke Miller, who are both really good at delivering high quality foot footballs, and Matt Rowell, who just goes and extracts it for the you. The weapon. Yeah, you have guys that have actual distinct roles in that midfield that work really well together, uh, unlike that, just to compare to that Adelaide midfield. And then in number eight, heading to the top eight, I've got St Kilda, who dropped down a couple spots, or just dropped down one spot after they lost to Essendon. Fair enough. Fair enough. And uh, we know that they'll, we know that they're a good team, and I do think that they'll make the top eight because I think Ross Lyon's a fantastic coach that'll make them play well in enough games, despite how competitive the league is. In seven, I've got Port Adelaide. Now, you'll, Ooh, okay, Port Adelaide are good. They're really good, and they put up a great fight against Melbourne. Could have easily won the game, but there's a certain team that was given a Hyundai a couple weeks ago. And right now, I think I think they're on an Audi at this point. An Audi, yeah. which what type of Audi? Audi i8. Is okay. that a car? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know cars, but I know that's a good one. It's an A5, which is average. Is that are you going for average here? I'm going for better than average. Okay. I'm going for like sh chic sports car kind of thing. Like an R8 then. R8 is yeah. what I meant. I Audi R8, like Fremantle. Wow, they could have easily been like that. That first game against Brisbane could have easily been brushed aside and they could have rebounded back downwards, but they have really held the fort uh, in terms of their reputation as a contender this year. And you just love the way that they're playing. We talked earlier about how strong their defense is. I think huge tests for them next coming weeks. They play Carlton. Huge game. And then they play Port um, yeah, in Adelaide. Two massive ones. Two so yeah, we'll, we'll, ones. we'll get a proper test of Frio in the, the next couple weeks. I know they did play Brisbane, but we'll, we'll have, a, have another look at them. Yeah, now can you just put this one on for me? I can't do it. And you, you talk about it. Oh, God, this one's tough. What if we just don't put it on? We just leave the spot. <laughs> Fine, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. God, I hate this because I watched the whole game today. It was really tough to watch. Maybe I won't say anything. And there was a part of me when the game was like... I'll just show you. When the game was in limbo, that I thought maybe they'll just give two points each. They're a good team. I'm confident in saying they have the best forward line in the league by quite a distance. 
Um, yeah, you look, I, I talked about how they have potentially the best key forward pairing in the league alongside that Carlton key forward pairing. And then you also have Ollie Henry. Stop talking. About 40 goals last year. I don't like it. Brian Myers. They, I get it. They're good. They, they didn't even re, they re, re, rebuilt for, for one year. And Just they're back. Messi over there. Grand okay. Messi. <laughs> rebuilt for one year. They rebuilt oh for gosh. one year. Look at West After Coast. a grand final. Grand final. Grand final, one year rebuild. Now they're back to being a contender. And, yeah, didn't even have danger field. <laughs> it just looked yeah. unbelievable. They're really good. Melbourne in four. And I like Melbourne. They had a huge win against Port. Every reason to go up in the rankings. And there's just a lot of... Uh, we're going to need to see a team like Carlton falter. And Carlton, again, strong, but hard to judge them against North Melbourne. It was... They weren't at their most intense, conceded about 90 points for North Melbourne, which I don't think their coach, I don't think Vossi will be happy with, but I think the team seemed to lower their defensive intensity a bit against West, West they're Coast. Like, and they're North. like a bit of a shootout, yeah. the teams that we've seen so far. They, G- just, GWS they just back themselves to kick more goals in transition. Yeah, and just because of how good they've been in the first three weeks, I'm allowing Sydney to keep their spot at two. Okay. Even though you have a, a couple... Any, un- any bias? Any bias there? I thought about it. There's no bias. I've decided. And I know the. There's no bias. I've decided, I've decided objectively. There's no bias. There's no bias. I would have had them a little, a few spots lower based on some other teams' consistent performances. Listen, guys, I love philosophy. I understand the paradox that me saying that I don't have bias means nothing, because bias is something that you're typically not aware of. But can I swear? No, let's not. Okay, because well, we're making a lot of money from these videos. I sh- shouldn't get it demonetized. Not the viewers. But f that. Did hit five hundred subs. <laughs> Just hey, say we so did. We did hit five hundred wow, subs. Wow, that's yeah. huge. That's huge. The people are liking the videos. And only four hundred and seventy of them you told to subscribe in person. So in that's person. pretty good. Yeah. Just have a lot of mates. You can make a good YouTube channel. <laughs> but um, uh, in number one we got GWS, and I still think the Sydney teams are the two best. I think Sydney will bounce back, and. These are the two strongest teams in the league. Sydney should have learned a lesson in that Richmond game. But you had a very hungry Richmond team that had absolutely every reason at the MCG to to be at their best, and they were, and Sydney faltered. I think they'll learn a valuable lesson from that game. And GWS, they had a bye, but they're the best in the league right now. What's the opposite of, of ominous? Ominous? Yeah. Well, if there was a word that was the opposite of ominous, that's how I'd describe GWS. Oh, because ex- ominous exciting. Like, yeah, they're exciting. As in, you're, you're, you're like, they're very good, but in a positive way. Yeah, as, as in, a... <laughs> something something good is going to happen. Oh, as in, I can see oh, a good outcome from yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that there's a word, but I can't think of that's it. Okay. That's okay. We'll <laughs> that's okay. We'll move on power. to our, our last little little chat. It's Supercoach. All right, and your man, Dossi, Aiden here, had a good round. Had a good round. Top 2%. Top 2%, yeah. And this is a guy in his first, this is a guy in his first season, and he's beating me. Uh, I was trying to teach him a couple things, and now he's beating me. So I, I don't. Yeah, I was. I was really happy with with a couple of the guys this week. <laughs> a couple of the a couple guys. of the guys. The Dons. If you can play the my Don. team, you're doing a great job. Yeah, good. A couple of guys. Yeah, Matt Crouch. I brought him in this week. Good. Um, hey, might not be playing a good role. For, no, he is playing well for Adelaide. He's, except he's got a great super coach role. Obviously, I've got Heaney. I've got yep. Jackson. Your miss. Your your honourable miss from earlier. If I had Heaney and Jackson in my team, oh, oh, man, they'd be they'd be. <laughs> Ground will be shaking at the moment. Yeah. But yeah, I absolutely love my team. I sort of missed on the captain. I think a lot of people did with, with Bontempelli. He was the right choice, so you're never going to be mad when you know you made a, a very smart, like a, a very safe choice. And he still got he still got his way to 110 points. But I'm really happy. Yeah. I'm I'm now third in our in our Supercoach League. So yeah, I'm guys, the join the Supercoach League. It's been on the screen the whole time. And whoever Thomas Footy Campfire is, is doing exceptionally well. At the moment, at the top of our league, in the six one hundreds, very strong. So, so good on him. Um, so yeah, I was really happy with my round. A couple of guys I was a little bit disappointed in. Yeah. Um, especially Darcy Wilson. Um, I was looking yeah. to make some good cash from him. Blake Howes, very disappointed with with his performance. Um, yeah. Everyone else, I was I was okay with. I was okay with. I'll just say quickly, RIP to anyone that did not pick Max Gorn in their starting team. You. I think like, you've missed it now. I think there were a couple of people who saw the game in round zero, got scared, didn't pick him, and now they're absolutely ruining it. He's now 640k with a break even of 78. Yeah, and there, there are certain times where people just tear up the, the super coach comp early, and you think, oh gosh, I've sort of just missed the marker now. For example, with Heaney, I kind of think I've missed it now. He's that expensive that I've just got to hope that he his role gets shifted or he has a, has a bad game or two to get me back on those guys that picked Heaney. Uh, but Max Gorn is just going to... You just know that he has that role. He has 
that ability that no one else can take from him that you need to pick him even if you didn't start with him. So you just have a disadvantage on those guys that picked Gorn and you're not going to get that Just back. a guy, I don't know if you'll agree with me, a guy you have to get in now. He did go up 60K in his Matt most Roberts. recent week. No, Tom Powell. Yeah. I think Tom Powell, he or, he's still 375K. But with a negative break even. With a negative yeah. break even. Um, I think he's a guy, whatever you whatever you have to do. If you've got Jordan, that's an easy, probably an easy swap you can make, but you have to work to get him in. He's got the highest or second highest center bounce attendances for North Melbourne. The highest. Over he the last kicks few goals. Weeks. He gets clearances. He's effective. He's cheap for for his role. He's going to get around 100 points a game, maybe more. He's got a good ceiling. His um, what's it? his low? His his, his base. His bottom out. Oh, his base. Yeah, his floor? base. His floor. floor. That's the word floor, I was looking floor, for. Floor. His floor isn't very low. So you're probably going to get a pretty good score from him each week if he continues in this role. There's no reason why he won't. So. Get him in at all costs. You must get him in. Yeah, last week, two goals, 28 disposals, five tackles, 92% center bounce attendance, the highest at North and almost the highest in the league for a midfielder. This week, also the most center bounce attendances alongside LDU and a goal and 29. So, yeah, he's a guy who you could almost pick as a primo midfielder and he's priced at 375k with a negative break. Mm, 100%. So you got to get him in. We both kept Hayden Young. So. And, and Nick Martin. I didn't keep. I oh. took Nick Martin out in round one. So um, he butchers the footy. He butchers the footy. He's a good player who's going to get a lot of cheapies, and those cheapies are going to be kicked. Potentially, I don't think he's going to get that <laughs> that score necessarily again for a, for a little bit. He might, but yeah. he's got the potential for those scores. So yeah, very happy I kept. Nick he's Martin. a good pick for Supercoach, especially at his price. I was very tempted to take out Hayden Young for a significant part of the week. It was Luke Ryan in, which wouldn't have been a bad bad option because he did score well. He went up in price, but I'm gonna. Decided to back in Young. I had trades to make elsewhere, and it, it really did pay off here. Yeah. I think you said to me after round two that you noticed with Hayden Young when we were talking about potentially trading him out, you said he always goes for the difficult mm. kick. Just yeah, yeah, I did. As, yeah. yeah, as in, you, you, it, I feel like that's something that, obviously, I've never played midfield in the AFL, except you can sort of tell with these young midfielders that it takes them a while to learn that you don't have to always go deep and create something incredible. Sometimes you gotta you got to figure out how to lower the eyes and find an easy target. And you don't have to be the one that, go, that goes and blitzes through. And I think he's just take, it's taken him a couple games and he's already adjusted. He was really good with his decision making. In the first two games, he already had that energy, the tackling, the contested ball, getting some uncontested ball as well. It was just the mistakes. Now he seems to have settled down into his role. Yeah, his scores were, were, well, just be on it. They were terrible the first two weeks for oh, yeah. what we expected from Very him. Cool. But... That was purely based on the clangers that, that he had in those games. I think it was nine in the first game, maybe seven in the second game. I think it was game. nine again. Yeah, but was something, something everyone like, had him, so it was fine. That was fine, but yeah. lots of people took him out, and I don't think they're going to waste a trade to bring him back in. They will not. Um, so, yeah, we're really happy on that front. We're both doing decently well. Um, next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll hopefully keep moving up the rankings. Yeah, Trade-wise, it's sort of what to do with Darcy Wilson and Blake Howes and those sort of guys. Maybe an Alex Sexton, a Jack Billings, if you have them. Those are four guys in my team who are guys that are not performing well. They're not going to go up in price too much more. And you sort of think, do you, like, with the extra trades this year and the extra buys, do you, you have to get more aggressive? Do I trade them out now to, even when they're still going to gain some cash for guys that are going to gain more cash quicker and for a longer amount of time? Um, that's something we've got to figure out and sort of, Plan long term, I think. Well, I'm being aggr I'm probably going to be aggressive again and make three trades. So use your third bonus from three rounds. Third bonus from three rounds. I know I haven't Oof. played the game before. <laughs> it is potentially dodgy, but it's I've got dodgy. I've got too many players that aren't playing. Now, Zach Reed and Caulfield aren't generating cash. I've got to make a trade there. I've got to get Tom Green in, um, and I've got to probably take out a Barry or a Sexton in the forward line because I don't see too much more cash gen from them. It was a mistake bringing in Barry, uh, yeah. Tom Barry. I think I know he got me good cash, but for the trade in and out. Don't think it was worth it, so yep. unfortunate, but that's that's going to happen. And Tom Green, I think, uh, I don't have him either. I think he's going to average 130 this year. I think he's going to do what Bont did. has got to be a must-have. He's going to do what Bont did in Supercoach last year, I reckon. He, he might be M1 by come the end of the year. You know, have you heard that term? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So I think I've got to get him in, except, honestly, there's someone else. Uh, I'd love to get in Tuke Miller, but there's no way I can bring them both in this week. I heard um, you're, a, you're a big fan of Zach Merritt as well. Oh, yeah. So starting in round six, yeah. Zach Merritt and Essendon. Wait, do you have your fixtures up? I can get them quickly here. Look at Essendon's fixtures from round six onwards. From, and from round six. Okay, so yeah. they have Adelaide, yep. Collingwood, who are good to score yep. against, West Coast, yep. 
GWS, who are good to score against as, as a midfielder, which we've seen in the past. North Melbourne, Richmond, Gold Coast. It's not too easy but to score against. Gold Coast is where the run sort of ends, except you sort of have maybe, six the, maybe the six easiest midfields to score against in six rounds. Yeah, wow. Because you have, uh, as you say, you have like North Melbourne and West Coast who just don't have strong enough midfielders in there to, to compete with a guy like with a guy like Zach Merritt. But and then you have teams like GWS who they just back themselves to to out out clearance you so they're not going to pay any attention to to guys like to their center midfielders. So I think I if bringing in Tom Green now means that I can't bring in Zach Merritt in round six, I don't think I'll bring Tom Green in. Oof. Also against the, against the curve. I think I might go against the curve. Oh no, but you're gonna have to bring him in at some point, and he's just gonna tear up every round. Well, he's probably gonna yeah. go up. He's gonna be around 700 in a couple weeks. This is where Nick Martin, even though he was just awesome, and of course I'm very, of course I'm gonna keep him at, uh, after after that performance and that role. But he's an awkward player to have because you'd rather have Tom Green and Nick Martin's just holding. But 500K I guess you could keep him for two weeks, and because that now 136 is in his system. Yeah. The, so you can use that that low break even to maybe gain a bit of cash and then trade him out. Yeah, the plan would I think in the long term yeah, what's is the plan. <laughs> I don't get I don't get the reference. No. Okay, don't worry about that. The plan is in the long term, uh, in over the next couple of weeks, I'm thinking maybe I don't make a, 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 don't make any trades apart from just side trading Darcy Wilson or Blake House or Zach Reed to to guys that are going to gain me cash or Sam Barry depending on selection in the Adelaide game. Starts, but yeah. basically, side-trading rookies, I don't really see anyone else I'm happy to get rid of right now. I think what it will be is in a couple of weeks, I go James Jordan and Jack Billings to... A primo. Uh, primo on a Tom rookie. Green, Zach Merritt, Matt Rowell. Oh, sorry, sorry. Did I say Matt Rowell this whole time? I meant, yeah, Tuke Miller. Uh, one, Tom Green, Tuke Miller, Zach Merritt, and and a, and a rookie that's going to gain me cash. And then eventually move on um, eventually move on Nick Martin and upgrade him as well and then <laughs> obviously at some point guys like Matt Roberts and and Harley Reid they'll get moved on to Colby McCurcher I see myself keeping for a long time same as Riley Sanders I've almost guaranteed to I'm going to sideways trade one of my premiums um, LDU to Tom Green yeah um, LDU had a disappointing score of 67 and that's just not a floor I can I can have in a premium again he can go and he can he you're can trading LDU score. Trading at LDU because I have to accommodate Tom Green. Um, Zach, oh, wait, I want to say Zach. Aiden, we'll talk offline. <laughs> I'm, okay, side, I need... Side, I, I, at, at this point in the Supercoach Cup, I really discourage... I'm ruthless. I'm doing it. <laughs> ruthless to yourself, man. I, I have to, I can't figure out another way to get him in. You know, as in when it comes to I, I think, Tom Green versus LDU, I think, like these but are I, my, no, I think the micro difference, differences where I think it is LDU be, could easily score better than him for the next five rounds. Potentially, potentially, and yes. I could save a trade doing it. <laughs> but that's currently the thinking. Wow, the, the current trade, trade, is, trade is Tom Green for LDU. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you liked. I hope you liked the podcast this week. Hope you liked the quiz. If you have anything you want us to do, the next week's quiz or another quiz, anything else, let us know. Like, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.